Hello and welcome, or welcome back, if you're a regular, to DWeb Decoded, uh, the Falcon Foundation and Falcon Foundation for the Decentralized Web's a regular look at the people and the places and uh, uh, events and happenings and publications all around the decentralized web. That includes um, uh, the long history of trying to re-decentralize the web and also new developments. Uh, and I'm not sure if blockchain is, is new or not these days, but uh, we're joined today by one of the people that's certainly pushing blockchain in, uh, in new and interesting directions. That's Diana Barrera Gonzalez. Uh, Diana uh, works in blockchain technology with a focus on sustainability, uh, having begun her career in international development banks and the private sector. Uh, she currently serves as Head of Research and Sustainability at the Global Blockchain Business Council, which we will shorten to GBBC because that's what everybody calls it, and has played a key role in GBBC's uh, Global Standards Mapping Initiative. Diana, it's 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 great to have you here. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Where are you, if that's not too pertinent a question? Yeah. You're, you're in New York right now? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the GBBC people uh, are kind of New York based. And of course, it's the home, one of the home of the United Nations, Absolutely. which, um, yeah, yeah. I know Very that, that we do the applications of blockchain technology to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But I guess we'll get to that. <laughs> No, it's it's a great way of leading into it. I think. I think I, I have to be. I have to be clear here. So one of the things I didn't mention is that you uh, you're co-author of a book, Transparency um, in ESG and the Circular Economy, which I realized I have a copy of. Um, How and like I I know I know. So I, I I bought it on I bought it on Kindle because you know one should read what the guests uh, are up to. And as I was looking at it, I went, wait, I have this on my bookshelf. And I think it was, it was, it was available at either a GBBC event or a UN event. So, um, uh, so, uh, yeah. And, and I think one of the interesting things about that book is it was obviously a very blockchain -y thing that I, I was, at but the book itself spends a lot more time talking about uh the sustainability goals um esg itself um and the nature of kind of the regulation and um sort of redirection of economies so that they can be more sustainable mm -hmm. all of which feels very different from how i i I feel a lot of people have come to the blockchain space. So, um, so what was your path from international development into the the wacky world of crypto? Absolutely, it was very unexpected, and it was very much of a um, out of the box journey for me. But I started my career working at the Inter American Development Bank initially with the private sector operations, which are basically. Uh, the investment banking branch of, of a multilateral development bank and that focuses on transactions that are either in debt or in equity, but there's always an international development focus. So there's a very strong element of defining indicators to monitor and evaluate impact for each of the transactions within the private oh, sector. Right. So for example, like loans to corporates with an element of job creation that's very intentional or an element of sustainable, energy efficient operations that are, are very, very uh, intentional and embedded within the, the operations of, of the company or, or whatever the, the loan will finance. So that got me into that the fact that it is possible to embed sustainability across sectors and across in industries into the very business models of what you do, having seen that level of transactions. What I came across in international development uh, also was the the difficulty in moving money though the difficulty mm -hmm. in and and the the time it takes to actually uh, realize uh, disbursements especially when it's across countries and across different currencies so that's what took me to to the role of blockchain technology in a way and also when you combine that also to the needs of the world and and if you think of the UN sustainable development goals uh, as as a 
framework, or even before that, the the Millennium Development Goals that were reevaluated that led to the Sustainable Development Goals. And not a lot of people realize that to get from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, there was a lot of discussion. And there was actually a publication that was co-authored by a lot of the development banks and the international institutions that was called From Billions to Trillions. We don't need billions of dollars to allocate money to meet the needs of the world. We actually need trillions. And the only way to do that is to better engage the private sector along with the public sector and the collaboration of stakeholders. And I also realized along the way that the meeting the, the needs of the world um, is not just, it's not as simple as reallocating money, but it's also really it goes back to uh, creating networks and, and opening access to networks of productivity and growth to otherwise excluded populations that are really, really big in the billions and billions of people all over the world. And there's such a market opportunity in creating access. And what really creates access if it's not through technology? So that's what took me to the intersection of financial services, movements of money for financial inclusion at the intersection of technology. And sustainability is is rather complex because it can mean different things depending on what you're doing, but but there are common frameworks out there and we are developing um, more and more indicators and, and ways of measuring and monitoring. And where blockchain comes in is it's all about the data, the transparency of the data. So let me, there's a lot to unpack there. So let me see if I can, I can kind of walk through. This is for me <laughs> as much as it is for the audience. So... In a traditional development bank, right, you're making loans, you're, uh, you're, you're doing all the processes of a bank, but you're also intent on getting results that are, aren't necessarily measured in the profit loss sheet of that transaction, right? So you're right. going, we're making this loan, but part of the reason we're making this loan yeah. is because we're trying to decrease unemployment, right? So yeah. there's this stuff that's kind of separate but needs to be uh, bundled is that kind of in the contract is like how do you i know this is probably going too deep into your past life but like do you go unless you know there's an unemployment numbers go down like will i i don't know like the contract fails or what 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 are the what are the incentives that you try and engineer into a traditional yeah, transaction. That's a great question because it also touches on how we frame certain business issues, right? And as we're seeing money flowing more into sustainability, what's the intent going going into right. that, right? Well, technically, from from international from an international development perspective, there's there's a lot that you can see where where there's developed countries and developing countries and it's actually beneficial it's a win-win situation it's beneficial for the developed countries when developing countries grow and improve their economic situation because that means better trade relationships better intellectual uh, sharing of ideas just better bigger market uh, on a more e bigger market uh, everyone's on a more equal playing field and it, it creates better interactions for everybody actually which is why these development banks even came to be right as a response to post world war II um, ch charters that, that came around the time that the UN came about right uh, where where countries committed to allocating some of their taxpayer funds toward pools of money that would lend toward the development of education or transportation, infrastructure, healthcare, you you name it in, in the developing markets as, as a way to equalize the playing field and hopefully lead to less geopolitical conflict, right? Peace through commerce or, or all of those things. So that was the, the philosophy behind it. And as the world is evolving and the role of technology is is becoming more and more front and center, you can see elements of that philosophy also coming into um, the world of blockchain that's exploring sustainability. Right. So, so there's, so there's that sort of measurement process and being able to see that you're getting results. And also as you, as you sort of touched on, there's also like the more you reduce the friction in that system and the more you introduce sort of more people and more commerce um, uh, and widen the market, right? Then, then, then the better, the better that is. I have to say, right? Like, you know, I guess the, the cliche of a traditional cypherpunk is, 
is not strongly connected to to like you know the idea of like the un i think it's connected to the idea of like markets as solutions for things right yeah. but generally it's sort of like you know the untrammeled free market rather than we're trying to steer this market for a set of goals that we've we've set differently was there kind of a any kind of culture shock when you went into like blockchain land or was did you feel like this was this was home or ways, common ground? It, it, in many ways, it was the answer to, to a lot of the issues that I, I was I was looking for. And as you see, like we do need a balance between between large institutions and the more decentralized communities and and what individuals themselves can do. Like what blockchain offers that I'm so excited about is is the opportunity to introduce a new generation of business models with individuals at the center where it's all about networks, right? And the individuals and peer-to-peer -peer interactions. And if you see, again, back to international development at, at a local um, perspective, there's no substitute for, for local knowledge. And to be able to integrate the, the individual contributions and the local knowledge into the governance and, and decision-making structures of, of whatever projects there are. And we've seen um, a fair amount in DeFi or in the regenerative finance world that really brings back a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the attention, and, and a lot of the conservation issues um, and, and connects it to the local knowledge. I, I think it's a great balance. And I, I think it's something definitely Definitely worthy of, worthy of exploring. So one of the things I kind of not struggle with, but but it's one of the it's one of the bigger sort of challenges, and this is viewing things more broadly, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, when you know one of the things that a decentralized network of any kind, whether it's a com commerce network or uh, just a software network, right, connecting is is standards like. Mm -hmm you you end up with a very local first system but if everybody's talking a different protocol or a different language or has a different set of weights and measures or has different labor standards even right like you quickly end up with the same friction as you would have um uh e e you know even if there were there were tariffs and borders around those things they all work in 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 the same way to kind of impede that um, I know that at GBBC, you're talking a lot about like um, uh, mapping global standards, right? Mapping out like these standard structures so people at least know, well, okay, I have a vision of what that might mean in a blockchain environment. What, 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 do, what does it actually mean? <laughs> what, does, what does mapping global standards look like? Yeah, uh, and it's a work in progress. I'm so glad okay. you did that. Okay. <laughs> But we have a global standards mapping initiative that has a number of different work streams. It's a very crowdsourced and it's also open source repository of relevant themes, key themes in blockchain technology. And I do want to highlight, like, what are standards? What's the importance of standards? We need common rules of the game to some extent, right, in order to be able to work together. If I tokenize an asset in my platform, and you alluded to this, and you tokenize an asset in your platform, we're not going to be able to trade, right? And it also right. brings, and it also to some extent levels the playing field back to the international development lingo when there's not so much of a feeling of us and them, I'm donating to you. I'm the good guy. You're the poor guy that needs help, right? No, but it's more right. leveling the playing field so that we can all participate in a common market, in a common platform where we're all um, contributing and, and adding value in, in different ways. So standards are really important. And the data that goes uh, related to it is also also very important. So for example, oh, like da standards on I data transparency lost something or there. standards on me? tokenization okay, of assets. Back. We have a um, um, repository where we've mapped out 63 global bodies that are advancing standards for blockchain technology, many of which are uh, globally uh, respected standards bodies like ISO, NIST, or, or also local local um, industry associations or, or even regulators that are advancing standards in, in different ways because of the importance of, of having common language as key to scale. And I think one of the things that makes, so one of the challenges, I'm just putting my kind of software hat on here. One of the things I 
obsess about and a lot of the people here to, that I talk to at the lower level of this stuff is interoperability. Like, as you yeah. said, right, I have a smart contract working on my blockchain, but like it's written in a different language and it has a different consensus model. So how do we connect it to others? But I think this is a more, both a more general problem and a thing that, that it sounds like you spotted as, as there being a kind of attempted general solution for in this space, um, which is uh, how can we automate those translations, right? So how do we, given that we have, we have this idea of programmable money, exactly. right? We can attach metadata to it and say, this is the path that this took. So, you know, if you're trying to work out what this is, then, then, uh, uh here is some additional information and we can have gateways and systems that say, um, but my experience of the internet, the early internet, was that there were networks where I had to kind of sign a contract or agree to a, a whole list of things, to including software, to connect to it, um, to be part of that network. And then there was the internet where I could just plug in, and as long as I written some, you know, as long as there was some software that was compatible on my local machine that could talk to those standards we were away. Right. And, um, I guess is, is that, do you see that kind of pickup in the global South? Like, is it yes. one of those things where they go, Oh, we could do this, this super bureaucratic way, or we could just like start from the get go. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important and we're getting there. We're getting there again. It's a work in progress, but one example I could point out would be the role of climate markets, uh, carbon markets cool. uh, with, with respect to um, carbon credits. And again, referring to the token taxonomy framework um, as, as a standard, but um, the role of blockchain can be fundamental in preserving the trust of carbon markets, which have unfortunately suffered from from a lack of trust where where certain carbon credits were, were demonstrated to actually not have a positive impact on on the on on the world and, and not not be of the positive impact that that they claimed or just money moving around with with no real actual results right so this right. also goes into redefining economic models but how can we do that unless we have trustworthy data and without standards, that's that's really fundamental. That's a fundamental piece, and and where we're standing right now, just to to give a little bit of context, and and we actually wrote a, a published a paper on on the role of blockchain for sustainability recently within the GSMI framework, um, and it's really about we live in a world right now that has for years and years functioned with a very linear system and an extractive model between the global north and the global south where largely resources from the global south were extracted and we pay for things and we assign value to things as, as soon as a tree is, shut, is, is, is cut down, right? We start paying for things and the economic incentives come in. And then there's an incredible, uh, there, there's consumption, there's demand, and there's an incredible amount of waste after that, right? How can we, we reimagine economic systems in the way that are more circular and also allow us to allocate funds toward the preservation of natural capital? An example of allocating funds toward the preservation of natural capital assets is allocating funds toward um, carbon reduction, carbon avoidance. And, and whatever goes into, into carbon markets. So standards on the tokenization of a reduction of capital, uh, of carbon, are, are essential because there's many different ways of reducing or avoiding or, or uh, capturing carbon and, and being able to create the, the quality and the, the price transparency uh, into the economic models and that go into these in, into these markets, it all goes back to standards, standards and transparency of data. So I just want to. This might be a little bit of a side track, but like you mentioned, you mentioned circularity there, right? A mm -hmm. circular economy, and I know that this is a theme that comes up a lot in in your writing. Um, uh, could you just sort of spell out what what? Because in my head, like. 
economies are always circular because the money is always going around. But there's something different and more interesting going on here, right? There's it's it's having a more intentional approach that we're not just extracting resources that will eventually go to waste, right? It's right. it's being mindful at the point of extraction and consumption that there can be a more clear pathway toward recycling, reuse, and and ultimately um, feeding into um, feeding capital back into the places that where we extract resources from in a more fair way. What, what has happened a lot in, in supply chains that, that we've seen thus far has been um, the economic relationships between the global north and the global south have been very unequal and very extractive. So if we are able to create markets, and, and this is essential for sustainability, we're looking into um, the Paris Agreement and, and addressing climate change issues, which, which are something that affects all of us. And if, if we can more clearly fund um, the preservation of natural capital as part of the circularity of, of an economic system, that would um, also preserve capital remaining in the global south and aid uh, for the competitiveness of those economies. So a lot of this is sort of about like you say, being intentional about like the paths that the the capital flows down, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think one of the things that you 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 get to see in the crypto space is I think of it like electricity, right? Like you have um, you have this electricity, which is the money, and it's supposed to go through this complicated system to like you know power something. But if you have like a security flaw or somebody recognizes, you know. Of a vulnerability, it's like a short circuit, and suddenly all the money goes to like some mysterious actor, <laughs> like who, who isn't part of this system at all. Or you know, even without any kind of malicious intent, um, there's a there's a shortcut, right? There's like so you go, okay, we're going to build a system, and it's going to divert some of this money to um, mitigate uh, uh, um, carbon. Um, uh, um, uh, it, it leaks in the system. Uh, and then there's a short circuit, which can make you slightly more profit without mm-hmm. doing all of that, uh, that takes you in a different direction. And so that's the kind of like almost non-malicious way where the efficiency engine of, of the market system just finds something slightly more efficient. And then there's the sort of slightly more aggressively kind of immoral or, you know, like someone has to explicitly do it, which is ideas of, of corruption. Right. Um, so, you know, you have a situation um, like uh, uh, a, a conflict situation like Ukraine or Afghanistan, um, and uh, uh, you, you, you're trying to put money into that system to raise it up, to improve matters but a huge chunk of it and i think this also happens historically in places like palestine as well right Mm -hmm. where you're trying to give money for development but it gets redirected um uh, into corruption Mm -hmm. so i guess one of the questions i have is like because i think this is a problem that maybe the blockchain community and the crypto community did not think so explicitly about at the beginning um and now are like going oh shit right like we have to solve this problem um but also this is clearly like must be a huge chunk of what um your previous background in international development thinks about are there any lessons from international development you think you can that can be applied in a decentralized way in you know the the chords with how blockchains and crypto web3 systems generally work to help fight that kind of problem? Yes. I think the reliance on um, transparent data, the the emphasis, even though the international development traditionally hasn't had access to, to transparent data in the way that blockchain provides, but the emphasis on um, designing projects from the very beginning with the right indicators, what are we going to measure? 
And how are we going to monitor and evaluate progress at the end? Because the last thing we want is to deploy millions and millions of dollars into something that actually is not going to have a result. So because it's international development, because budgets are limited often, and because of the um, nature of, of the, uh, the um, intent behind projects, it's really important to measure results. And a project that doesn't show results is, is probably not going to get funded uh, eventually in, in, in repeated iterations or, or whatever. So in, in the design of the very project, in the, in the design of the very loan, of, of the very um, whatever, whatever it is you're funding, you're already thinking, what, what um, job creation measures am I going uh, to follow? What uh, environmental impacts am, am I going to follow? What biodiversity um, uh, indicators am I going to be mindful of? And over time, you, you get to see the data, the numbers, and, and the effects that the funds had on, on whatever indicators you, you came up with. So I think um, that mindset is is very very fulfillable with with blockchain technology if you design the right indicators and you um you you design and identify what you're going to look for and that data can be captured recorded on a blockchain and, and provide an unprecedented level of trust and as you're following funds from donor to actual beneficiary and actual recipient uh blockchain technology has the ability to follow every single step of the way. And we're actually working on a um, collaboration right now, uh, GBBC in collaboration with the World Food Program's Innovation Accelerator called Food for Crisis. And mm -hmm. Filecoin Foundation has signed on as one of our initial supporters, which we're very excited about. But we're working to actually build the infrastructure using blockchain technology to follow, track, and trace funds from donation from donor to the final beneficiary in, in areas of, of food, um, providing food and, and addressing hunger issues all over the world. Um, so on the one hand, you have the infrastructure uh, with cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain technology. And in the areas where there could be quote unquote gaps, where you're using the traditional financial system or other other tools like, uh, for example, mobile minutes in Africa or digital vouchers in, in e-vouchers in, in Latin America, we have a functionality to create a digital twin and still follow everything all along the way. And something like this, if deployed at scale, could really revolutionize um, development and, and the way aid functions across the board because there's no gaps there's no mystery you see exactly where things go and with blockchain technology you can also have an unprecedented level of visibility into the impact of every single dollar and if you can also connect the impact of every single dollar to the very individual that provided it that could also create even more incentives and, and ownership of, of the donors that can see exactly what's going into operations and marketing and what's going to the final beneficiaries. It is super interesting. So as soon as you you started your, your, your answer, I went, oh, this is really compatible with how at least the community in um, the sort of the, the part of crypto that Filecoin is part of that we end up working on. And a lot of that is about engineering these incentive systems, that the, the innovation with um, uh, uh, the, the, the Satoshi's paper kind of brought was less kind of the building blocks and more, oh, we can build this thing that incentivizes us to do the thing that we want them to do uh, as as a byproduct of of, of the processing, um, so so that makes that makes a lot of sense. I the bit that like I I don't I, I'm still kind of crunching in my head is that there's also a theme, particularly in the kind of human rights work that 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 I come from of of privacy. Right. Yes. Of actually, you know, what we want is is control not only uh, in our transactions, but also privacy in those transactions. Because if you knew every transaction I had, mm -hmm. then 
it wouldn't just be a matter of tracking my money. You'd actually be able to like, you know, know where I was and, and, and draw all of these same kind of conclusions. How do you balance that kind of individual privacy with the kind of um, uh, auditing that you're thinking about in these contexts? Yeah, and I, I, obviously this is this is a conversation that's still a work in progress. We're still designing our our first pilot that's going to come to fruition hopefully soon um, with our one model of fund flows. But it's really important to to your point. It's really important, and and when you think of the world of digital identity and uh, really structuring what kind of information gets posted on a blockchain as opposed to not generally the best practice and even ways, for example, the, the privacy authority in France has done a really good job of, of defining in what ways blockchain can be compatible with GDPR and things like that through um, l- different levels of um, pseudonymity where, where information can be conditionally available, conditionally made available upon request and the self-sovereign identity component where people maintain control over their own data, personal and confidential data as a best practice is not posted directly onto the blockchain, but different aspects are made conditionally available upon request depending on on different circumstances and and transactions get carried out. The operations that we need, the the, um, fund flows and, and whatever we need to happen happens, but the data of the individuals and the confidential data is, is safeguarded in the right ways. And I'm, I'm sure you can, you can speak more to, to models where, where that can happen in the best ways. And, and lo- would love to hear more about that as we, as we think through our, our pilot, we'll, we'll continue our conversations too. I know. Um, yeah. but that's, that's very, very important. I, I think, I think people outside, outside the space kind of us underestimate the degree to which, um uh this is sort of a, 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 how much people are working on this and thinking about this i mean in particular i think you get the, the stuff that we're talking about where you're sort of sitting you, you you need some kind of backing for something that you're saying, right? You're going, oh, we did this and we did this. And it's fine to record that, but like where does what's the base truth? How are you how are you how do you prove that? And there's a whole space in in our industry that is, is driven by mathematical proofs, right? Like mm-hmm. We know that you um, you did this and this because you signed it digitally, or you know you did a hash, yeah. and then there's this whole set of um, of of zero knowledge proofs, right? Where you're able to say, I can prove that this happened, but I'm also I can do that proof without revealing some of the inputs that the only that, the, the like. necessary information gets right. Noticed. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very hard often to wrap for um, uh, not just state actors, but corporations as well, right? Because, you know, in a digital environment, the temptation is just to collect it all, particularly if you're doing some sort of like monitoring or auditing process, mm-hmm. because you want the maximum amount of evidence to look for fraud or to double check your working. I find it really hard in the privacy context. I find it really hard to tell governments and corporations to not collect, you know, to to minimize their data. And, um, do you, do you, when you're talking to regulators, when you're talking to to the UN and development banks, is there this sense that you're kind of asking them to go against their intuitions of collecting all of this data? I think there's there's a general awareness that privacy issues are important. I, I think um, the specifics are 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 more more complex, and I think uh, sometimes you need there's an educational component in, and, and this also obviously applies to the conversation on CBDCs, like the, the specifics of, of how privacy can and should be carried out um, are still in development. I, I think it goes back to education, starting with education in many ways, especially, um, especially with the regulatory conversations, maybe even one-on-one type, type education. And, I mean, this is a little softer and, and fluffier, but I still think is really important, you know, 
in dealing with the the world of uh, a previous kind of period where tech met, met regulators, right? Uh, both to work together and, you know, to go, please don't regulate us in this bad mm-hmm. way or regulate these other people in this good way. Um, as much as there was a discussion to be had, there was also kind of a culture clash, right? Like yes. you, you, you sit with, with a bunch of, um, you know, high level state officials and then, your gang comes in and none of them were wearing suits <laughs> like um or, or, or you know or formal dresses uh, right yeah. right and like so is you without prying you know having talked about privacy like is your did you come from a background where you knew about that world did you learn about that world were you born into that world in the un world um Or did you learn very explicitly how to do that? And how do you explain it to other people? Yeah, it was very much self-taught. I got into the space because I thought financial... Well, first of all, I grew up in Bolivia. So the concept of financial inclusion, the concept of economic disparities was was something that I saw at a day-to-day level, right? And which is also why I worked in international development for, for, for a number of years. But the connection with blockchain technology was not clear to me at all. I, I, I didn't know about it until until my MBA, my second year of my MBA. And it was like a little project in, in a digital marketing class. And, and someone mentioned Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. I'm going to look into it. But it wasn't it wasn't I hadn't made the connection. And then um, through through the role of fintech. And uh, then I started going to some events in, in New York where, where eventually I did make the con- connection. But it was at the time of the like ICO boom and like reading all the white papers and talking to right. all the innovators. So it was very, very hands on. And I was very intentional about like there's something here where, where a decentralized financial market infrastructure can have a big impact in, on, on financial inclusion alongside everything else. Um, and I ended up uh, co-authoring a paper on decentralized financial market infrastructures. And, and when you write, I, I, I like writing a lot. So when I write, I process a lot of information. So it wasn't just a lot of reading, a lot of writing, but um, thinking through also the, the role of stable coins and like the internet of, of, of money and value and, and being able to send money and in, immediately that, that resonated so much because people in, in developing countries often have mobile phones, but they, they don't have a lot of internet co- connectivity and, and, or, or like they don't have a lot of um, access to bank accounts, but maybe they don't want to have access to bank accounts because the financial right, system right. is very broken. Right. Right. And, There's and not very areas, much trust. Yeah, yeah. 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 So sometimes we assume, Oh, they should all have bank accounts, but maybe not like in places in Africa, there's people who make the decision. I, I don't want a bank account. So it's yeah. like seeing the local realities and the way that connectivity and, and crypto functionalities can really bring people into the the mainstream e- economy um, without going through the hoops that that financial systems or, or whatever uh, frictions of, of local economies can can entail, um, or, or also the fact that um, even immigrants here in the U.S. or or the poorest of the poor they they get charged a lot of money in, in interest, or they don't have access to to credit and loans in the same way that we do. So it's kind of incredibly expensive, and it doesn't have to be. So so the role of stablecoins or remittances, right? They they get charged a ton of money. They don't have to, right? So so things like that. I think it's a challenge too when it's sort of the improvement is incremental, right? Like mm-hmm. I think you know people. Uh, talk have talked to me in the past you know and there have been these you know they go well what about cryptocurrencies like yo-yoing in price like you need stability in it and i'm like well first of all you can construct that stability within the system right but secondly you are quite you are not unique but there is a very large number of people who've never had that level of security any level of security in the stability and the price of the currency that they have to work with. Yeah, exactly. I was in Argentina right. in the summer and by coincidence, I met two people in, in random conversations who own crypto because it's, right. and own Bitcoin as, as right. an alternative to a better store of value than the local currency. I, I right. was shocked. And, and the level of local, um, uh, and entrepreneurial activities at a local level and that are happening all over the world. It's like people, people have drive and people have innovation and, and people have good ideas and, and can create great things everywhere in the world. And why not bring them into the mainstream? 
Um, I think this one, yeah, I think one of these things is that, and I totally understand it where there's always this description. I've probably said this on this show. I've got to be, we've done enough of these shows now where I'm going, God, am I just repeating myself? But, um, uh, the people go, Oh, crypto is doing this speed run of regulation. Um, and you know, it starts with none and then it gradually learns why there are these checks in place. And I'm, I'm like, yes, and that's good because there's a lot of dead wood in our existing regulating system, right? It was lots of it date back, as you said, from from straight after World War II, and it's not the best system in the world. It has a lot of path dependencies. Mm -hmm. And like, even if we're just going to end up with a very similar structure at the end, we have this opportunity to create a more efficient, equitable, and sort of optimized version of it. Do you think there's anything apart from the technology about how this subculture or this community works through this problem that could be taken back absent blockchain and brought back to kind of the the development the world international development community i think it's the philosophy the philosophy that's not so much us and them but like everybody together because it's not so much when we think so much us and them, we're almost objectifying the the recipients of money as like less than sometimes or like right. incapable when when we level the playing field and in a peer to peer environment, there's much more of an equal mindset, equality mindset, uh, more of an inclusive mindset, which is at the core of a lot of the regenerative finance innovations that have equality at the core and and where you have business models. And we are seeing this in the Web3 world already with many, many business models that are integrating sustainable sustainable practices into part of their their day-to-day -day operations through uh, net zero and 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 transition plans that are, are very realistic by by working and operating on on energy efficient platforms and also allocating a lot of efforts into into more inclusive economies um, right. I, I think that that um, the concept of peer-to-peer -peer governance and the inclusion of individuals at a local level into the governance of operations is something that we can very much learn from in, in larger institutions and, and especially economic development. Yeah. It's always sort of the, it is this ideal model of a transaction, which is where both people benefit, right. And you mm -hmm. come, you come as equals and, you know, mm -hmm. I have something you want, you have something I want, and then we 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 negotiate a price between those two things. And I think people don't realize that. I mean, people understand that when there's inequity, that like you say, there can be an extractive process. But also, how damaging kind of the I'm giving you this for your own good. I mean, I sort of told, mm -hmm. I, I fell into that model earlier on when I was like going, well, how do you make sure that like you know the unemployment numbers aren't going up? But I, I, I've, I've seen that too, right? Where you go, you have to break out of this sort of charitable frame of mind because you're just, you're simplifying who this person is. Um, and you know, even if you're thinking, oh, I'm doing this for the, you know, because I want this yeah, person even to very, succeed. Very well intentioned, and that's actually been a problem. That can actually be a problem with very, very intentioned charitable activities. We're seeing like, we see, for example, an example in Africa, in a post-war like Rwanda areas, like in a, in a little village, for example, where a charitable organization from the United States donated a ton of eggs, right, in a way that actually disrupted the local growing chicken industry and the, the chicken farmers ended up not producing anything. And as soon as the huge egg donations ended because the funding ended because it wasn't so much of a world crisis anymore, the, the local chicken farmers didn't have the capacity to feed the, the, the local village because they hadn't, they hadn't built their, their business. Right. All it, of a sudden right. you create dependencies that are unnecessary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that the, the, so you want this sort of equity, but you also, I mean, I think this is something that the crypto community is kind of dealing with right now in that there was this huge swash of capital and money and opportunity. And 
you know, I think that broke a lot of people too, right? Like you end up going, yeah. okay, what do we do with this? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, you know, it, money is an incredibly powerful, but also a kind it's like plutonium or something, right? Like you, you have yeah. to treat it with some care and some, some protection. Yeah. That's why the importance of the indicators, the data to create an impact. But also we're seeing like an explosion of funds going into sustainability. How can those funds be deployed to to actually have a positive sustainable impact and not be like donations that are unpredictable in in some ways and create dependencies, but like really think it through very well, which goes back about into the data, the trust and and where we can uh, deploy blockchain in in very beneficial ways for, for, for good. So we're recording this close to holiday time, twenty twenty three. Um, as as this is, as you can see behind me, um, what are your um, what are your plans and visions for sort of where to go in twenty twenty four? I mean, personally, industry wise, yeah. GBVC, whatever you want to, yeah. to say. No, I will say personally, like if we focus on smaller granular tasks that we can do as as individuals and and make an impact. I'm I'm very excited about our food for crisis project that uh, hopefully in in collaboration with with Filecoin Foundation among others can bring together key stakeholders because working together we can get so much so so much further and and we we've already identified a number of different models of fund flows so our first pilot project is is only one of of, of many others where, where we'll mobilize uh, funds in a way that we can have like a toolbox approach that will be able to integrate and work with the existing payment structures at a local level. Again, whether it be mobile minutes or e-vouchers or the traditional banking system, bank accounts, such that we can track and trace exactly where funds, uh, donation funds are going and exactly the impact on, on reduction of hunger. Um, right. That's one element. And, and what I can say is uh, the E and the S in, in ESG, when you talk about climate issues and sustainability, climate issues disproportionately affect vulnerable and marginalized communities. So so we can't decouple climate impacts with social impacts. And what I'm seeing is, is just in the context of hunger, hunger issues are getting worse and worse and worse because of climate change. You're, you're seeing more of a migration crisis. You're seeing increasing inflation and food prices, which affects um, lower income and marginalized communities. So it's it's all connected, which is why it's so complex. But focusing on one issue at a time and collaborating, bringing people together um, is can can be huge. And I'm I'm personally very very excited about that taking off. Yeah, yeah. I think that one of the lessons of both the kind of success that that the world has had in 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 feeding folks and and you know the challenges of supply chains is any little Mm-hmm. It's it's all tiny little fixes along the way, and maybe maybe blockchain and and the work that we do will be one of those small improvements that will let yeah, everybody um, mm-hmm. uh, never be hungry again. Yeah. Damn! Thank you very much. That was a fantastic <laughs> conversation. And if, if folks want to follow uh, what you're doing, where's the best place for them to um, check out these projects? I'm on LinkedIn, we generally po- post um, all our projects uh, through GBBC or, or, or myself or, or social media and Diana Zales or, or LinkedIn Diana Barrero Zales. And, and follow GBBC as well. Like we we have a ton of initiatives and. Uh, it's sure. it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk to folks like you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, yeah. Thank you for coming along and uh, happy uh, happy uh, holidays. Happy holidays to you. All the best.